episode of Miraculous Thinking. I'm your host, Elenique Marie, and with me, the one, the only, Crystal Ann Compton. <laughs> and today, we are so excited to be bringing you our first session discussion of the four agreements. And Crystal, mm -hmm. <laughs> this was amazing. Mm -hmm. And I never cease to be amazed by this book. I mean, I I actually was wondering why I hadn't reread it because it had been about six or seven years since mm -hmm. I read it last. And it's like every page hits you in the face with some very deep truth. And it's so beautifully and so simply and authoritatively written with this conviction and this knowing that I just said, wow, this is why it's such a work of art and why it became the bestseller that it is. And, you know, as you read it, and when, when I read it, I like have the physical book and I also get it on Audible so I can hear mm -hmm. the narrator who happens to be really good for this book. So the narrator speaking, plus I'm reading. So it's kind of like two streams of energy going at the same time. But you can, if, you, if you're present with the process of the information as it's coming in, you can feel the activations. Like there's attunements. He is mm -hmm. activating you. He is getting you ready for the truth of these agreements and making new agreements. Like I could feel it. And I, I know I sent you a message and I'm like, I'm emotional. Like this is like dusting up some stuff inside of me. It's causing me to look at all these different areas of my life. And I too read this when it came out. I'm trying to think, well, I can look, but what was it? 2000 and I don't even remember. Oh my gosh, that. 1997. Are you kidding? So yeah, that's quite a while ago. So I probably read it in the early aughts and I think probably I was in college in 1997. <laughs> probably that's again. Scary. Like um I don't know, a few years later, but I haven't picked it up for many many years, but mm -hmm. I send it. The reason I thought I had this book was because I've always had this book, but I'm always giving it away because mm -hmm. it's so simple to read and it doesn't even matter where you are on your spiritual journey. You don't even need to be on a spiritual journey. You don't. It's really about personal development. And I just keep giving it away to people because it's so profound. And I had forgotten just how powerful it is. So I'm just blown away and I'm loving it. And I hope everybody following along, I hope you got the book. You need to have this book. Like, yes. Go get the book. Go get and the book. you need to read it. <laughs> Trust yes. us. I put this, I decided that, you know, this year, instead of struggling to figure out what I'm going to give people for Christmas, I'm just going to buy a whole bunch of these. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to wrap them up because this is the gift. This is the ultimate gift that you can give someone. And that is the freedom from the conditioning of the world and the suffering that that conditioning brings, you know, and in the first suffering and the one we were just talking about before we started recording, you know, this inability to love yourself. And um, that's something that he really explains in such an easy to understand way about why do we judge ourselves so harshly? And why do we feel like we're lacking? And it starts from the minute you're born. Yep. So maybe today we can look at, you know, we can start with chapter one. Uh, well, it's not really chapter one. It's called the, well, it is chapter one. It's domestication and the dream of the planet. What an incredible <laughs> title, right? Yes. Just incredible. And he just kind of opens it up and he goes for it, man. And he just talks about how this entire world is a dreamscape. And in particular, it's a hellscape. Yes. Right. It's, it's hell. And he, yes. the way he posits it is that we're living in hell and the only way to get out of hell is to ultimately change your agreements. But mm -hmm. the reason we're in hell is because we were born into um, a conditioned world and everyone and everything is conditioned based on rules and regulations and laws handed down by the people before them. And when you're born as a little perfect baby, you don't even have your own name. It's assigned to you. Mm -hmm. People tell you how to act, tell you what to do. You get punished when you don't do what everybody says you ought to do. And so from the very moment we take our first breath, we start kind of an entrainment process, totally. a brainwashing process. I think it was what really, really impacted me was when he said that we get domesticated the same way a dog does. I know. And he's and right. I thought about it. Yeah. 
do. It's like, that's exactly what we do. We tell, I mean, I remember saying when I was a little kid and people would be like, um, be a good girl. Don't be a bad girl. That's what bad girls do. This is what good girls do. Good, bad, no, you know, and the, and the um, gestures that tell you whether you're okay or not okay. The menace, you know, sort of, I forget what the word is in hypnotherapy. There's, there's this uh, explanation that uh, the inner critic that a person carries has a lot to do with the integrity of the words. So if the words and the behavior and the facial gestures that a parent does to a child, the more consistent that they are, the person ends up being a very physical person, meaning a person that's very embodied, you know, they're, they're not looking for the innuendo, they're not running it through their mind, trying to figure out what do things mean. But when you have a parent who says they love you, but the body language doesn't match, or the facial gestures when you do something wrong are very menacing or very extreme, you get a person that rightfully so doesn't know what's going on. So they spend their whole life reading between the lines, doubting, you know, that, well, well, is it what they say? Is it what they mean or not? And this is a person that cannot relax in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. It's always up in the mind and they're called emotionals. So those are the people that, you know, they use the, they use the mind as a defense for their body. So it's, it's very interesting. And I believe that that is one of the things that, um, I realized as a child was so significant was just the unspoken judgments that were communicated non-verbally. He talks so much about the word and the importance of the word, but there is such power in what is not spoken, what is just energy. And kids are excellent at reading it. Well, they are. And it's backed up by this process of reward and punishment. You're a good girl. Here's your reward. Mm -hmm. You're a bad girl. Girl, here's your punishment. And so we just train children. We send them off to school. They learn the subjects that society says that a child should learn. Really, when you look at it, we're not actually educating kids in the things that they need to know in order to live a beautiful, thriving life. We're teaching them all this sort of archaic stuff based on what society thinks is important. And so from the time that we're little, we're just marched through this endless process of rules, regulations, and laws. And this is the dream of the world. And this dream is always being projected into us. And Mm -hmm. it's being projected into, Don Miguel Ruiz says, it's being projected into our inner dream. The dream we have of ourselves is absolutely impacted by the dream of the world because the dream of the world is ever telling us who it is that we are. And so it's when it happens at such a young age, that means that we are ever trying to conform to the idea that the world has for our lives. And if we're women, then we're pretty. Or if you're men, then you're a provider. And you have all of these different laws and rules that you're trying to keep up with. And if you can't do it, then there's the inevitable shame of self, rejection by others, but more profoundly rejection of self. Like you reject yourself because Mm -hmm. you can't conform to the dream you have for yourself, which isn't even your dream, honey. This is the dream of the world, which is hell. <laughs> yeah, right? absolutely. It's hell. It is. It is. And he says there, um, we have learned to live from other people's points of view because of the fear of not being accepted and of not being good enough for someone else. So this indoctrination of who you're meant to be, who you're supposed to be, what you're supposed to look like, how you're supposed to behave starts before you even have a defense when you're just 100% open, Mm -hmm. like little babies and little children are, just fully open, no critical mind, no way of evaluating whether it's true or not. It's just dumped in there and becomes like a law, a law for you, the law of the world. And when you try to break the law, the punishment can be so severe that you quickly learn not to challenge it, even at your own expense. Even when that inner you, that inner knowing is rebelling and telling you, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. Don't do this. This doesn't make any sense. They're crazy. You don't have the courage because you're so afraid of the repercussions. Right. And 
we're afraid to just be our authentic selves or even go on the path to find our authentic selves and what really makes us happy and you know what really allows us to express our innate gifts and talents it's just we're so repressed from the very onset of things and you're right like as children you know we've talked about this before i think until the age of seven children are in kind of a state of hypnagogia almost mm -hmm. like trance they're just absorbing and whatever mommy and daddy tells them they just effortlessly believe if you say it's the law i believe it's the law because mommy and daddy told me and you know yes. as i'm reading this i'm thinking to myself oh my gosh all of the laws and the regulations and the rules that i consciously and unconsciously passed along to my own child Yes. And now she's dealing with these laws and she's dealing with an inner perception of self that is not reflective, potentially, we're working on it, but it's not reflective potentially of who she really is. And I had a hand in that. Of course, you know, Don Miguel Ruiz goes to kind of pains to say, you're not to blame. This is just, you've been domesticated. And as you become domesticated into the system, which basically means um, a match for it, aligned to it, perpetuating the system, then it, you're going to automatically do that with other people and especially your children. But I just felt like mom guilt, you know, because- Oh my God, me too. Me too. And, and my son is 10 years old and I was already like going through the millions of things that unconsciously, you know, and that's what we always talk about that to be a good parent is just to awaken yourself, right? Because an unhealed person can only perpetuate that unhealedness mm -hmm. onto those that they love, whether it's your child or your partner or your parents or whoever, right. you know, it's something we do to each other. And he talks about that, the, that words are magic, right. And it can be used for good and it can be used as black magic mm -hmm. and you can curse people with your words. And you were sharing some stories with me earlier about mm -hmm. how that, you know, how that was true for you. I don't know if you want to share with everybody a little bit about that. Yes. Um, so in the next chapter, which is be impeccable with your word, that's the first agreement. And according yes. to the author, that is the most important one. And if we can just shift this, if we can just shift our languaging and how we speak about ourselves and other people, and if we can just agree, like, this presupposes to me that I don't actually have to do yet in order to free myself from a lot of agreements I'm carrying around. I just have to agree and be willing to become impeccable with my word, which means I am in a state of awareness that my words are manifesting all the time. Every word out of my mouth is magic. It is up to me based on intentionality, whether that is black magic which means casting a spell or a curse over someone that changes them and who they are in their path or changes me, or whether it's white magic or pure magic, which is love. Yes. So, and it just made me realize like some of the black magic kind of curses that have been spoken over me in my life and primarily by my mom who was super well-intentioned. Like, I don't think she's out here like double, double, you know, boil in trouble. I'm going <laughs> to cast a spell on my daughter. Uh. She was just unthinking and languaging or speaking from her own entrainment. But she told me from the time I was a child that all of the women on her side of the family die prematurely. And I would always ask as a child, I mean, striking fear in my heart, I, I would ask as a child, well, what do you mean early? And she'd say, oh, in their 40s or their 50s. They, they don't live past that, which objectively is not true. My own mother almost made it to 70 years old. And I've got other women in my line on that side that have lived longer than that. But that doesn't matter. These kind of words aren't necessarily about facts or objective reality. It's about the power they have to, to change your perception of self or your potential. And so she probably said that for the first time when I was 10, I don't know, 11. Wow. And she reiterated that, you know, in my teens. And she was still saying that stuff even when she was in her 60s. So this is something that had been spoken into her. But I don't think she ever realized the pain that caused me and the fear mm -hmm. and the anxiety that I still have, always questioning my health, always wondering if I'm gonna make it, always in the back of my mind, trying to plan for my future, for my kids, when I die, what's my husband? Like I'm always, it's a script 
that was implanted yes. in the computer system of who it is that I am. Nowadays, I have developed the facility to notice the script because see beliefs that we have inside of us, they're always talking. And the language that they speak is the language of your thoughts. Mm -hmm. So your thoughts as they're unchecked and as they're floating around your head, they're actually expressing the pattern of belief inside of you. And so I have developed a facility to hear the thought and to recognize, oh, that's tied to this belief and that belief is not true. And so the way that you get rid of a lie is to bring in the truth, which the author also discusses. But I mean, I have to do perpetual work. I feel like I'm in a perpetual state of like, I've got to figure this out. I've got to constantly be managing that all because my mother unthinkingly spoke this over my entire life. And that is the power of words. Absolutely. And we do it to each other. Like you said, of course, you would never have done that to mm -mm. you intentionally. If, if our parents, all they ever want is for us to be happy. But we are so unconscious with our speech. We're so unconscious. I notice it even as um, a year ago, there was this challenge that um, I read about on the internet that was just don't discuss anybody or anything that's not you. Right. So it was just sort of um, no, no gossiping, basically. Mm -hmm. Right. Because mm -hmm. talking about other people, even 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 good stuff, it was just like, don't discuss other people, like discuss yourself, discuss what's going on with you, what you read, your thoughts. But that's it. I started doing that about a year ago and I felt my whole life shift. I felt it shift in the most dramatic way because it was as if all that energy that was being used to constrain people even with my own thoughts, because if we are all connected, which we discussed last week, if it is a holographic universe, if it's all one, if it's all light, then the thoughts and words that I hold about you are holding you hostage, even when you're not aware of the words that I am speaking and the thoughts that I am having. And when I blame you for what happened to me, I hold you hostage and I hold myself hostage. So it's just the most, it's, it's kind of scary, but explains mm -hmm. so well why we are in the state that we're in. Because if you notice, we confuse gossip with intimacy. Like people just love to talk about other people. And mm -hmm. that's just they being do. social, right? It's just social. Mm -hmm. We're just being social. We're talking, we're sitting by the water cooler, you know, talking about other people at the office. I wonder or that. why, like, why is that such... A human inclination to just kiki and talk mm. crap about other people that we have in common like why would that even but it is it's like that brings people together in a neg i don't even know why people do that i think it's a combination of wanting to reassert that you are part of the group that mm. tribal need to feel as part of the tribe and say look right. i'm behaving i'm i'm here and i'm talking to you i'm not doing what you know rosie's doing over there yeah that's not allowed Right. right. And everybody's like, no, it's not allowed. <laughs> we're going to keep, we're going to kick her out. You or know what we're, I mean? we're better than Rosie. Yes. And yes. Yeah. So we're standing, yeah, we're trying and to. And she might be a threat too. Right? right. So what we, what we saw was that if the world is in a dream and the dream is a program, it's a set of laws. Like I look at it as code, right? Mm -hmm. The code that we type in for a software to operate. Then if you disagree with the world, and choose to do things differently, you're a threat to the program. Mm -hmm. And so when people dare to raise their heads and say, no, I don't believe in that. I don't like that. Whether it's because they have a different sexuality, a different political view, a different religion, a different whatever, whatever it is that they have that's different. You notice how, you know, violently mm -hmm. people rise up out of anywhere to like squash it. And it's the fear, the fear that somehow this will threaten the status quo. Mm -hmm. That so seems that's more why. prevalent now than at any other time that I've been alive. Yeah. Just people needing other people to stay in their place, stay in their lane, don't speak on these topics, you know, do not deviate, always conform, which yes. goes against like a fundamental spiritual principle of I am, mm -hmm. <laughs> I am, and I am always creating according to I am. And that is not going to be determined by groupthink. Mm 
I just, it's just, it's just wild to me, like the paradox of how, as a society, a global society, the where we're moving in this kind of a direction versus individual sovereignty, free will, mm -hmm. free expression, creative, magical manifestation. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, other than duality. Well, it does make sense to me, but we don't have to talk. We can get into that in a moment. But to illuminate kind of what I was talking about with my mother and her words, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz writes in the first agreement, so which is the second chapter, um, an example. He says, we cast spells all the time with our opinions. An example of this, I see a friend and give him an opinion that just popped into my mind. I say, hmm, I see that kind of color in your face in people who are going to get cancer. Now, if this friend listens to that word, and if he agrees, he will have cancer in less than one year. That is the power of the word. I had a great friend, um, Tina Garino, and every time somebody said something that ran counter to who she believed herself to be, she'd be like, oh, cancel, 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 delete, delete, delete. <laughs> yes. All around the world, she's just cancel, 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 delete, delete, yes. delete, delete, delete. But you really have to be managing what people are saying to you because so many of us don't even notice that they're casting their spells well that comes to um i think that what he's implying is and then with this with this first agreement of being impeccable with your word and he goes into what is the word impeccable truly mean and it means to be sinless mm -hmm. and that to be in impeccable with your word is to not sin against yourself which is a very nice twist on that, right? Because mm -hmm. we're used to um, sinning against others and feeling guilty, but we never examine all the myriad of ways that we sin against ourselves. And at one point, um, he said that no one has ever abused you the way you yes. abuse yourself. Oh my God. No yes. one. I think I have it here. Um, I'm just trying to see where it was that I saw it. But he says, yes, yeah, something along the lines of, you know, no one has ever abused you the way you abuse yourself. And basically that what you will tolerate from <laughs> someone else is what you will tolerate from yourself. So if you are constantly beating yourself up and telling yourself how ugly you are and how stupid you are, you will tolerate that from someone else mm -hmm. because it matches what your inner dialogue is. And this is very powerful because this is a very good, when you are able to see what's happening outside of you. So what kind of people are you having mirroring your internal state outside of you? You don't have to go within yourself. <laughs> Just look at your life and you'll know what the thoughts are that you're having about yourself. Because if you're tolerating them, mm -hmm. they're resonating. They're matching your frequency. Mm hmm Elanique, that passage blew my mind. I've got like exclamation points. Can I just yeah, read it? Yes, because I yes, think it's, please. Oh my God, I was like, wow, truth bomb. He writes, in your whole life, nobody has ever abused you more than you have abused yourself. And the limit of your self-abuse is exactly the limit that you will tolerate from someone else. If someone abuses you a little more then you already abuse yourself, you will probably walk away from that person. But if someone abuses you a little less than you abuse yourself, you will probably stay in the relationship and tolerate it endlessly. If you abuse yourself very badly, you can even tolerate someone who beats you up, humiliates you, and treats you like dirt. Why? Because in your belief system, you say, I deserve it. This person is doing me a favor by being with me. I'm not worthy of love. I'm not worthy of respect. I'm not good enough. And I I just thought this line and the limit of your self-abuse is exactly the limit that you will tolerate from someone else. <laughs> that is so illuminating to me. Yes, me too. I think Sadly. this is why I don't have friends <laughs> except for you. I mean, I have a few <laughs> friends, but like my social yes. circle mm -hmm. is pretty small because I just, maybe I'm too old now. Maybe it's a lot of life experience, <laughs> but I will just not put up with abuse, which I, or gossip or bad behavior or anything that damages who it is that I am or takes away from my joy. Like if I, Think you're taking away from my joy then you're going to get a lot less minutes from crystal ann compton mm -hmm. which is a reflection of how much i love myself 
Yes, totally. I I love getting older. I love it. Oh, wow. I wouldn't trade it for the world. That's amazing. I feel myself to be the closest version of who I truly am now than I ever was. And in that is this self-love that comes because I now accept myself as I am. I see the value in myself that I never used to. It was the biggest struggle because when you don't see the value in yourself, you're constantly looking for validation outside of yourself. And then because you're craving that validation, you are a hostage to other people's expectations, needs, wants, desires. They control you. They manipulate you because you're so terrified they're going to withdraw their love and their approval. And as I have pretty much become exhausted by that, you know, and had some really challenging situations in my life, I, I said to myself, I just can't do this anymore. I don't have the, and I don't, even if I have to be alone at the bottom of a barrel, I'd rather be there than have to continue to play a part and wear a mask to please people. I just can't do it anymore. I love myself more than that. And that's when I started to feel the change in myself. When I was willing to say, I don't care what comes. I, I have to love myself more than this. And, and then I started to, to really discover myself, you know, and there's such a freedom in that, isn't it? It's Absolutely. Freedom. And I think with loving yourself, it mandates that you require the same level of respect from anybody who shares your company, who's lucky enough right. to share your company, if mm -hmm. that's how you feel yourself. But it, I mean, the reality is that there are too many people who don't love themselves don't yes. consider themselves worthy, don't consider themselves valuable. And as a result, put up with all manner of bad actors and people in bad behavior. That's why so many empaths who are filled with love and feeling attract narcissists, you know, because mm -hmm. they haven't gotten to the place where they are accepting who it is that they are and they love themselves for who it is that they are. It's so it, it's like the first thing you've got to do. But the impeccable with your word you know he references the gospel of john and it's in john the first chapter where it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god mm -hmm. have you ever like meditated on that scripture or like thought about that scripture what does that scripture mean to you elanique you know it's this idea of the duality that we now see in the world right so the manifest world is the word is the vibration, it is the action, it is the origin from where it came, it is all that. Because God is fragmenting him or herself in order for us to have this experience, right? God wants to know and experience him or herself. And so it only has itself to create with. It can only create from its own self. So all of it is outside, but it's still inside. It's all the same raw materials kind of vibrating in a different way, performing in a different way. That's how I've taken it to me. You know, that mm. that word that is God is sound. It's action. It is God. You know, it's all of it. So I don't know. What does it mean to you? Well, you know, when I was growing up as a Christian, I thought it always referred to to Jesus being God. Oh. In the beginning was the word. That's Jesus, Logos, the okay. vibration, the manifestation of God. And the word was with God. So Jesus was with God from the beginning and the word was God. So Jesus was God. It was actually a, a, a tool that I think Christianity used to kind of wedge Jesus in as a <laughs> prime deity. So I always yeah. thought of Jesus. But there's also kind of a cool esoteric application to that as well. Like Jesus is the creation of the father representative of the father, but in this human form here within the Maya with us ever manifesting and ever displaying what is possible for us to manifest. And that is God too. So Jesus is the creation is God. Right. And just like you said, you, he's God's creating from itself, which is harkens back to Goddard talking about him that hath more will mm -hmm. be given mm -hmm. from the half that you have from your create chore do you create do you move in the creation of but to him that hath not more is taken away yeah. so that's 
but it but it's the words that you speak eleni can mm. and so there's a couple of things i want to talk about here first the words that we can't control and also the idea of reverse engineering words so please remind me to get to that one because i'll probably forget. okay reverse engineering all right yeah but what I was thinking about is like just all of the spells and the spell casting, like this whole world is full of spell casting, I feel like. Mm-hmm. And it's coming through your television, it's coming through your Twitter, your Instagram, your Facebook, all the posts. These are all words that people are putting out there that you are absolutely taking in to the being that you are. And whether you know it or not, you're making conscious or subconscious agreements with what it is you're taking in on social media. And of course, we know that when you agree with something, when you and I agree on anything on earth, our father in heaven is going to give it to us. So I just see us all on social media or or watching these shows and unconsciously agreeing with everything that's being said. And when you take the premise of Don Miguel Ruiz, and he's like, this is a hellscape what does he say? This is like a marketplace with a thousand people just chattering, mm-hmm. which is, you know, also Maya, which is the illusion. Yes. When that's what's being broadcast is the dysfunction, then you're always taking it in. You're always vulnerable you to what these spells are transmitting. So you have to be super conscious and mindful about what you're taking in at all times. Absolutely. I love when he says, um, the fog is a dream. The fog is this thing, this these beliefs, right, that are shrouding the nature, the true nature of who we are. Your personal dream of life, what you believe, all the concepts you have about what you are, all the agreements you have made with others, with yourself, and even with God, that is what has created this fog over who you truly are. Your mind is a dream where a thousand people talk at the same time and nobody understands each other. That's, and it feels so accurate. It does feel accurate. You know, and that's the saddest part because we want to connect with other people so, so, so badly. I always just remember as a child having this emptiness, this longing, this longing, and I didn't know what it was. What is it that I'm longing for? And it manifested itself itself into a million questions. I used to drive my parents nuts. Like, who is God? Where is God? Why is the sky blue? Why, you know, what, why does this happen? What? And they were like, oh my God, please, no more questions. You know, you know, and I always felt bad because I asked questions and like I could tell I was frustrating people, bad because I couldn't get an answer. And I felt so alone in the not knowing. And it was only later that I realized I had questions because when I looked at the explanations around me, it seemed insane. Mm -hmm. I remember being five and being like, this doesn't make any sense. I was born in the Dominican Republic and there's a lot of poverty there. And I remember sitting in the car and having children come to the window to sell fruits or food or whatever, no shoes on, no protection. And I knew how well protected I was and taken care of like a, like a, like a jewel. You know, my mom would take care of me so carefully. And I looked at the window and I was like, but that child is the same age as I am. Why is nobody protecting that other child? Why is this child valuable, but that child is invaluable? And I knew somewhere in that five-year-old, this is messed up. And how are we ignoring this child coming to the window to knock on the window to ask for food? What is wrong with everybody? And I knew it from then. And so Mm -hmm. that was the problem that when you cannot accept it, you can't fit in. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I think that's also comforting because inside of us all, there is an inner GPS system that is always pointed toward home, which is to say always pointed toward God. And the feeling of that in the life is, or the vibration of that in the life is peace equality, um, goodness, kindness, joy, all of these things are good gifts from God. And we have this inner homing system directing us toward that, especially children. Mm -hmm. Children are so turbo connected 
to that plane of existence, but it's as we get older, we get indoctrinated, we go to schools, we've got mommy and daddy and priests and teachers and all of our authorities telling us who we are and how we should be, that we become lost in the illusion or the delusion of this life. But that doesn't mean that homing signal is not inside of you it absolutely is and for don miguel ruiz he says that the first agreement which again is to be impeccable Mm -hmm. with your word is the most powerful agreement because if you can start changing what you are saying about yourself and about life and about the world you can not only start changing what you're manifesting but you can uncreate all of the agreements that were put into you against your will that you grew up with and all of the other ones that you agree all of the other agreements that you made while you were unconscious or you didn't know better the key to doing that work is starting now with your languaging and how you're speaking and how you're creating absolutely i love that he says um in in these agreements you tell yourself who you are what you feel what you believe and how to behave and the result is what you call your personality Right. So your personality is only the sum total of the agreements or the teachings that you have agreed with the stories you were told that you gave your agreement to and changing your personality is as simple as withdrawing that agreement and saying, no, I don't believe that anymore. I don't agree to behave this way, to think this way, to judge this way, to see this way. Because basically he says that we're just, if, if you want to live a life of joy, you have to have the courage Mm -hmm. to break the agreements that are based in fear and step into your power. And he says at the end, and that takes a very strong will. And that's what I think is important that we have to recognize because we are in a world right now where we all want, you know, the instant solution right? Like the diet that in 21 days lose 21 pounds. Yes, please. Well, (laughs) sign me up. But it's, it's unhealthy. And we don't care. We just want the result. Well, no, I don't care. I don't care. Why do we want the result? Is it because we want to conform? I think so. To an external idea or even an idea or an idol of beauty that we hold within ourselves. So it's like, why do you even need to do that for yourself? Well, exactly. Because you could take, because don't you notice um, we don't usually see ourselves as others see us? Yeah. And so you may be, and I always tell you this, I'm like, Crystalline Compton, you're one of the most beautiful women in the world. (laughs) And yet, how hard is it to truly let that in Mm -hmm. and believe it? I know I find it hard when somebody Mm -hmm. says something to me. I'm like, there's this part that's like, Ah, uh, gee whiz, gee shucks, what the hell are you talking about? Shut up, move on, right? <laughs> right. Like it's uncomfortable, it's uncomfortable, I'm Why? uncomfortable. Why? Because it doesn't resonate within. Because there's an Im- a representation, an image, a belief that I am something within me that is not what other people see. And if it, did res- if it did resonate within, it must be outpictured from there. So you, maybe you're already beautiful. Um, well, if someone said to me, you're a perfect healthy weight, right? Cause right, right. now I want to lose 20, 25 pounds. You're perfect healthy weight, but I can't receive it. Cause I don't feel that about myself. I've got an agreement inside of myself that that's not true. But if I shifted that and you said to me, you are a beautiful, healthy weight. And I agreed with it and I accepted it. And I took it into myself, casting a new kind of a magical spell. Then my subconscious, which we learned about when we read Goddard yes. would set about out picturing that and Mm -hmm. assuming I would lose some weight maybe because the body is the landscape of of the intention and and the subconscious the body is ever out picturing your beliefs of self I just that's just how it works but it all has to start with your ability to clear the agreements and make some new agreements starting with this agreement that's it and clearing the agreement is step one because you cannot make room for something that that is already being occupied, right? We talked about Mm -hmm. that. That's why when people say to me, what's the number one thing that I can do to start changing my life? You know what I tell them? And Mm -hmm. it's nothing to do with thinking. Declutter. Declutter. I love that and feel that. Right? Because of space and energy and breeze and breath. 
we are going to have our course that we're not going to talk about yet, but everybody get ready because in end of November, December, your life's going to change by 360 degrees. <laughs> but it is, the reality is that the world that surrounds us, our home, our memories, our pictures, our art, the clothes, the shoes, are all triggers and anchors to the past. So, you know, that Marie Kondo, she's mm -hmm. like, does this, you know, does this bring me bring joy? You joy? Mm -hmm. Does this bring <laughs> Yes. Okay. I keep it. Right. But if it doesn't, I don't. And I really read that book and I was like, yes, yes. And I did it. And at first it was so hard because I was like, oh my God, I spent so much money buying that or I had to work so hard to get that or my grandma gave that to me or whatever. But I was like, I really was strict with myself. If it doesn't feel right. My subconscious knows why this is triggering something that's not beneficial. It's tying me to a memory of the past. And I don't want to be that person anymore. And I don't want to have that life anymore. I want to have the new life, the one I'm creating. So if you declutter your environment, you declutter your mind mm -hmm. externally, right? As a symbol. And then you begin the process of decluttering the thoughts by choosing which ones you feed with your attention. And he says that the first thing that he says, and I thought it was amazing, attention is the ability we have to discriminate and focus only on that which we want to perceive. Using our attention, we can hold whatever we want to perceive in the foreground of our mind. So what is the key? Attention. You just have to choose where you put it. Think on these things that are lovely. <laughs> Think on these yes. things that are good. And this is why when you watch that hoarder show on A&E mm. and they've got <laughs> rivulets of fecal matter going down the living room oh and they've God. got boxes and you've got flat cats and everything. Not to laugh, I mean, but it is pretty terrifying. <laughs> They're all horrible. It's terrible. Oh but God. I mean, they are so out of control, but they all have some kind of a mental or traumatic kind mm -hmm. of an issue that they're not dealing with or it's not being treated and it's showing up in their physical environment it is always going to show up on your physical tapestry yes. whether that's in the tapestry of your body whether it's in your actual house and yes i mean everything is energy and so mm -hmm. if you have one of those rooms that's just stuffed to the ceiling with all the stuff you don't want to deal with or look at and it's full of clutter that energy is projecting itself out into the rest of your space. It's not like it's really hidden. It's still there. It's still signaling. It's still mm -hmm. part of you. And there's a reason you don't want to clear it either. There's a reason you don't want to deal with it. It's so, yes. it's so connected. It's so connected. It's the outpicturing, like you always say, the outpicturing of your inner state outside, right? Mm -hmm. So that chaotic, cluttered, filled room that you're ignoring is representing some aspect of your own self that is cluttered and chaotic and you mm -hmm. don't want to look at. So the outside is always telling us what's happening on the inside. It is the reflection mm -hmm. of what is happening. And we think it's the other way around. We right. think that what's happening outside is affecting what's happening inside when it's inside creating what's happening outside as Neville right. <laughs> explained to us over Thank and over. You, Neville. Yes, it yeah. is. The outside is the cause. Wait, yes. no, the it's inside the, is the it, cause. Yes. Wait. We, but we think it's the cause. We think I'm unhappy because of the cause, because of everything yes. happening in the world. But no, what's happening in the world is happening because the cause is inside of you. Correct. The call is coming from inside of the house. Mm -hmm. Well, what I wanted to say about reverse engineering language is that, so as I said earlier, like we, we store within ourselves beliefs and um, conceptions of self, these limitations of self, um, some of us harbor offenses, have unforgiveness, have trauma that is unhealed, just all stored inside of ourselves. And that is all energy in patterns existing within us. That energy is moving. That energy is always talking. And we can hear what those patterns of beliefs and offenses are actually saying when we listen to our thoughts unchecked, just the ones floating around in the background like this being in a marketplace with a thousand people, like all these mm -hmm. conversations, like if you actually listen, you can hear what some of those conversations are saying, and those are directly tied to your beliefs. And if you are not intentional, the beliefs show up in the way that you speak, the way that you speak about yourself and the way that you speak about others, the way you speak about the world and your condition, it's going to show up in your languaging. 
Now, some would say, and this is true, that you can start with the beliefs. You can get to a hypnotherapist of great talents like Elanique Marie, and you can start working <laughs> on some of these traumas, bringing light into these spaces and clearing the patterns. And that changes the thoughts. And then that changes how you speak, which then changes what you create. But you can also just start now changing how you speak. I love what you had just mentioned, like an experiment of only talking about yourself and not talking about anybody else. Well, what if you could only talk about yourself in loving terms, right. even if you didn't believe it, because the pattern is in there of unbelief. Mm -hmm. But if you did it anyway, it would still create based on that. Like you, so if I don't believe I am worthy, but if I change my languaging and my word to reflect that I am, that will reverse engineer into the pattern and start to mm -hmm. loosen it up mm -hmm. and remove it. Now, if you do it at the same time, you get a talented hypnotherapist like <laughs> Helenique Marie, and you're working on the trauma on this end, and you're working on your word on that end, boom, you can clear up so much, so much just by doing that. And that's being the thing about it. The synergy of it is, okay, how long do you want to take? Because I mean, you can mm -hmm. do it. But right. I mean, that's why I always tell people, do you do you want rapid change? Because it is possible. We now know how to create that rapid change. You just have to decide and commit because in three to six months of seriously committing to inner work, you can transform your reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is fact. That is right. not some made up, you know, promotional. It's a fact. I see it over and over and over. And Speaking of which, remember we were talking earlier about EFT, yes. which is just energy psychology and works on the meridians mm -hmm. and you utilize these triggers, right? So when you feel any kind of way during the day with disease, not disease, but dis-ease, right? And right. you're feeling frustrated or angry, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The line that they use in tapping, you're tapping your point and you say, even though I don't fully see and accept my worth. I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Do you see the language? Mm -hmm. Because even though A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever it may be, I deeply and completely love, so self-love, and accept self-worth myself. And if I love myself and I know my worth, then I can release anything. So this is what is so incredible. And when we synergize these things mm -hmm. together, conscious noticing, right? So mindfulness, creating a mindful life, reading books that support that, having conversations that support it, having friends that support it, that are high vibrational, that are talking to you about creating things as opposed to breaking other people down, having an environment that supports it, having a person that holds space for you, utilizing energy psychology, you know, energy psychology to release things, utilizing hypnotherapy. When you put that together, mm. it's, it's a bomb of light, <laughs> right? You know, and it's amazing. Yes. I feel that. And you know, yeah. I, I'm teaching a program right now called 360 Align and Activate. And we're just in the week where we're dealing with our body. And what I'm reminding them about is that the physical instrument, the body stores the stories, stores the beliefs, stores the trauma in actual places on the body. Mm -hmm. Like that knee pain you have, you think, oh, you know, I've been jogging for too long in my life. And it's just because of that. No, there's other things connected to the pains and the symptoms in the physical body. And there are places in your body where it's more apt to store certain things, which is why I think something like tapping in conjunction with impeccable words, in yes. conjunction with intentionally getting into noticing and feeling and getting into things, that's why it's so powerful because the body is holding it all. It's really the key to it all. There's a beautiful book called The Body Keeps the Score. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend that. Let's do that book. Okay. Put it on the, the list. The body on the keeps list. the score, I think. We have to put that on next. It's just unbelievable. And it's about that. It's about that. That's why tapping works. Because when you get that feeling of not good enough, you feel it somewhere in the body. 
Your body's listening all the time to everything right? and storing mm -hmm. it. So some people, when I tell them, okay, where do, where do you feel that in your body? They're like, here, I feel it in my, in my stomach. I feel it right here. I feel like enough because it lives there. Mm -hmm. It lives there. And when we activate the feeling, we find its location, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like angry street, sad street, you know, that's where it lives right. somewhere in there. So we have to allow it to move through. Mm -hmm. that's what we, we haven't completed the cycle. That's why it's still bothering us. It started and we held on to it. We didn't let it move through us. It's like the rain. You know, when you see those clouds, the clouds are coming and they're dark. But if you just watch, they just move, they move and eventually they pass. We don't, we grab all those clouds and we shove them in our body. And we say, these are my clouds and nobody's going to take them from me. I'm going to feel this. Or worse right? yet, we identify as the cloud and exactly. we don't understand that we are the sky exactly. upon which the clouds are moving. Yes. I yes. And I do think that words are so powerful to get in there to get into these really hard places and painful places. And I think a lot of people don't do this work because it is uncomfortable. And you also think, well, if I'm gonna do this work, if I wanna release all of these agreements, that means I have to be in the energy of those agreements actively. Again, I've gotta look at where they come from. I've gotta sit in that, I've gotta relive pain. I don't wanna be uncomfy. And so people just kind of reject it mm -hmm. because of that. But just as you said, like, a willingness goes a long way. A willingness Absolutely. goes a long way. And just a willingness to be impeccable, like I'm going to change the way that I speak, being in a disposition energetically of allowance in this way starts to do the work for you. Like, and that's Absolutely. the best thing about God. God knows how to heal. <laughs> and if you open yourself <laughs> up to God, God will come in and do the healing so you don't have to in a thinking way and mm -hmm. in a re-traumatizing way deal with all of your stuff i mean you do to some degree like sometimes sometimes you do have to do that you've got to sit you've got to sit with it you've got to talk it through but so many times it's just an instant release or you can feel it moving out and the words help to move it out absolutely and that is the thing you the words are important and people are scared of words because they use them all the time right mm -hmm. they use them so they're afraid to recognize the power of the things that they're saying, because it means that they're going to have to change what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Once you understand the power of something, you can't keep misusing it because then you have to take responsibility for what you're creating with your words. So it's better to pretend like words don't matter, like they don't hurt, like they don't cause war mm -hmm. and suffering and destruction. And like he says, words and language are a double-edged sword, right? One side cuts and one side creates, one side frees. And so the question is, are you willing to do the work to create with your words? And it takes discipline. It takes discipline. It, There's it no does. way around it. <laughs> it really There's does. No way. I mean, maybe, if, have you ever met somebody, Elenique, who's just, super reckless with their mouth like they so. have no idea mm -hmm. the damage that they're doing to themselves and to other people yeah. i used to be that person yeah. i used to be incredibly to truly <laughs> honey mm -hmm. i was my father's daughter i'm wicked smart and i just had a viper's tongue my friend and just like wow. in my oh god early 20s my first husband god bless him may he be rewarded in heaven <laughs> he's not he's not dead <laughs> like may he be rewarded and blessed because of like i just it was like this weapon that i yielded and people do this and you know Ruiz talks about this, like you think when you are attacking somebody else with your words that you are attacking them, but you are always only attacking yourself because That's their right. reaction to your evil words is going to be your reaction directed at you. And now they're fighting with you and now they're attacking you and now they're making you uncomfortable. So it's, it's not something that you're doing to somebody else with no impact of self. And so for me, that was absolutely so true. And probably the biggest work of my life was around shutting my mouth really, yeah. because I just wanted to 
<laughs> it's like a machine gun. Just, just get everybody. You know, that was my inclination. And I had a lot of healing to do. But the first thing I, I learned to do was to be quiet. Mm -hmm. And when I got angry, instead of blowing up and speaking all of this black magic, poison, toxicity, and barfing yeah. it all over somebody, I just was like, mm. that didn't mean that didn't mean I wasn't angry. That didn't yes. mean that it, I had to you know, I still had to work on it, but just being quiet and then being super careful about the words I did say when I did speak, wow, that accelerated my ability to become a conscious and good person. Yes. Just right. by starting there, just. Well, it's mindfulness, right, too. It's mm -hmm. like you are you are creating a gap between the trigger and the response, because let's face it, a lot of us, I remember being like that in my teenage years, which was the height of when I felt pain in my mm -hmm. life. Right. And as a consequence of the pain, I was just lashing out at everything. It was almost like this, this is the only way I know how to be. This is the only way I know how to protect myself against the disappointment and the sorrow of just the world, really. And so I was ready with a gun. You know, it's like, I'll shoot mm -hmm. first and ask yep. questions later. Mm -hmm. And in proportion to how I healed, that dropped away from me until now I find it one of the most difficult things to hurt anybody, even when they have it coming, right? and even when they're doing terrible like things. Like the pendulum like, swang, like swang, swung so dramatically <laughs> like to the other side that I actually had a hard time speaking up for myself yep. or like taking up enough space in a conversation. Like, like it the pendulum always swing back to the middle like to the center right it's, it's somewhere in the middle but i too like had to, i was overcompensating for so long that i had to teach myself to speak up again yes because then you start being cruel to yourself mm -hmm. see that's the other side of the pendulum because now you feel so guilty that you used to be that way mm -hmm. and now you hold yourself up to some ridiculous standard of goodness and beat yourself up with that standard of what a good person is and you make yourself responsible and take credit for other people's feelings as if they don't have ownership over their own feelings. You're like, no, I'm bad. I will. Oh, that hurt you. Let me put that on me. Oh, you're sad. <laughs> let me put that on me too. You know, let me carry this giant backpack. And until you either exhaust yourself or burn yourself out, because there's nothing else to do except to make yourself sick of carrying mm -hmm. all these burdens that don't belong to you. You know, right. and, and I, I told you the story about the wheel of karma, but I, I, for me, it's this, this story that I was told when I was doing my Kriya Yoga uh, apprenticeship. And, and the teacher just said, listen, guys, don't take credit for anything, good or bad, because karma depends on when you stop the wheel. So if you need a car today and I give you a car, everybody says, oh, Lanique is so good. Good karma, Lanique. Good job. And then if you get in a car crash, and break your legs, and we stop it at, well, if Elanique hadn't given Crystal the car, then Crystal wouldn't have broken legs. Bad karma, Elanique. But then when you went to the hospital, you met the love of your life, who was a billionaire, <laughs> and now you own an island. Oh, good karma, Elanique, because you gave Crystal the car that broke her legs and took her to the hospital that led her to the billionaire, right? So you cannot be so egotistical in life as to claim the credit or the fault because there's so many bigger things at work that are co-conspiring with you to create reality that it's unfair to yourself to give yourself the credit or the blame. And I have remembered that my whole life. I use it every day. Don't take the credit. Don't take the blame. And that kind of like lifts a burden off of you anyway, like it's just flowing. It's not like yeah. I'm responsible for this. I'm responsible for that. I am. I just am. I am here. Yeah. Right? I'm doing my best. If right. you can say that to yourself, mm -hmm. I'm learning as I go. I'm healing as I go. Mm -hmm. Oh, watch that. Oh, that's that's a painful something that happened to me that made me respond like that. Let me go heal that. Let me do something with that invitation of the feeling that is I feel bad. But instead of beating myself up and judging myself, let me utilize it to heal myself. So I don't have to keep doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. So use your pain, use your discomfort. Don't beat yourself up about it. You didn't put it there probably. 
And don't look for somebody to blame either because they've got stuff that happened to them too. Even if it's you, you don't need to blame (laughs) yourself. And he talks about like in a system that is just, which this world is not, if you make a mistake, you pay for it once. But because of the way that we interact with ourselves and with the world, we continue to have to make ourselves pay for all of the things that we did wrong. And then depending on our choices with who we surround ourselves with, maybe our husband continues to make us pay or our children or our parents continue to make us pay. Like you have to pay over and over and over again, but that's not fair. So even if it was you that caused the thing or was the impetus for the thing like blame is never appropriate like blame and shame is not godly it's not of god you don't need it it's useless it is useless well yeah it's, it's, it's but it's useless. created what does it change it's right creative it's cr- yeah. still creating for you but it's not creating anything that you want i remember did you ever watch that movie um memoirs of a geisha i did not it's a re- it's a, it's a be- okay I I don't know. It's like a Disneyfied version of what it truly means to be a geisha. But I was obsessed with geishas in Japanese culture, especially in high school. So I I read the the book and then the movie came out. And in the movie, there's a scene where the woman commits some sort of mistake. I don't know what it was. And this other one comes in and she's like, oh, um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry that I did this. And the other one said, being sorry is a waste of time. Because what it means is you haven't learned the lesson. Geishas do not believe in regret. They believe in learning the lesson. And so that's the biggest gift we can give to anybody for anything that we've ever done. And God knows we have all hurt each other so much over the course of a life. We failed so much over the course of a life. But if every time you got it wrong, you own the lesson. Mm-hmm. and make yourself better for it, atone, then you are creating something really beautiful out of the, the debris. Mm-hmm. Atone and attune. Yes. So I think that to make this, and even Don Miguel Ruiz says that being impeccable with your word like takes a lot of discipline, as you said, but I think just starting small Mm -hmm. trying to start first making the decision, I'm going to be impeccable with my word, and then developing an ability to kind of monitor what you're about to say, kind of catch yourself Mm -hmm. before you say anything, and then examine it to see if it is edifying, it is, is it enriching? Is it going to make somebody feel better? Is it going to bless them? No? Okay, is it neutral? Is it Mm -hmm. helpful? Does it add to anything? No. Is it negative? (laughs) Is it harmful? (laughs) Could somebody take this the wrong way? Like just to develop the ability of self-examination before you speak and erring on the side of Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) like really curating your words so that anytime you speak, it is a blessing or it is helpful or it is a great way of thinking of it. Crystal curating your words. Mm -hmm. I think you can imagine like our words are like pieces of art. Mm hmm that we're going to hang on the walls of a museum Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and really saying, would I be proud for that to be hung up? Mm -hmm. Or would I be ashamed after I saw it or disappointed in myself of what I had produced? Yes. Yeah. So I think we can start that way. I agree. Simple, small steps, right? Can I ask you a question? (laughs) Since we're talking about words, have you ever met somebody And it seems like karmically, I'm meeting a lot of these people. This is why I ask. But have you ever met somebody who cannot stop talking? For example, if you're in a conversation with them, my neighbor is like this. And I'm always like, oh, God, please don't come out and see me while I'm out and getting my mail or something. Because he'll come out and he'll just start talking about his day and the things that he did and then what he's going to do tomorrow. And I'm just standing there as if held hostage to this barrage of words that mean nothing (laughs) and are not actually allowing me to connect with you in any way. Mm -hmm. Like, and why are you doing this? Don't you, can't you see that I'm uncomfortable? Like I'm noticing that there are so many people who can't just be in quiet contentment with other people Mm -hmm. or, who just have to fill every single moment with a word for some reason. 
Do you know why this might be? There's a combination uh, of factors. Uh, in human design, there are we, we believe that there are types mm -hmm. that have different needs. And some people, they process their own thinking through hearing themselves speak. So they check in with themselves and know what they're feeling and what's going on with them only through speaking it out loud to somebody else, which can be draining, right? Mm -hmm. So because you're like, well, why the hell do I need to be like, the receiving end right. of this? Do you even so see it me? could be type, right. right? It could be type. It could also be a person that feels deeply lonely and unheard. And so the minute they see a person that's willing to give them the time of day, they're like vomiting, you know, all this need for connection that isn't there. But why you're specifically attracting it is a totally different question. <laughs> and, um, and I think that you have an aura that makes people feel safe and seen and accepted. And if you can do the math on this crystal, there's very few people that make people feel like that. And so <laughs> when you find someone that can hold a space for you to be you, no matter how messed up or stupid or boring that is, how that's dare addictive. You? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> so I right. think it's just, you just have to live with it. It's just your light. Your oh, I'm gonna, I'm, cancel, I'm, cancel, 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 delete, delete, delete. I don't think I have to live with it. I feel Learn like, to love talking about the mail. Oh, Hello no. Hello there. It's so, it's so, Um, I just, I start getting resentful about mm. it. And then I'm thinking, and I'm, I've, I've actually found myself praying. Okay. Angels, please get me out of this. Yeah. Please just somehow end this conversation. But what I really need to do is have boundaries yes, and boundaries. just be able to say, like my husband is able to say, okay, great talk, got to go and just walk away. Like, whereas I yeah. would be so mortified to hurt somebody's feelings to do something like that, which is why they're attracted to a person like me. And True. I am a person who doesn't speak a lot. I mean, I know I'm on the internet, you know, shrieking into the night, but mm -hmm. in my day-to-day -day life, I'm, I like have, I'm not talking a whole lot except to my yeah. husband or to my dogs. So maybe it is a counterbalance to that. But I like really value words. And I've yeah. always been enchanted by like entomology and just the way words flow and alliteration. Mm -hmm. And I've always had a sense that words were magical, the way they're yeah. arranged and strung together and spoken. Like I can really relate to that. So I don't really want people to just be so careless with their words. I hear you. And yeah. ag again, I think the boundaries are very important. And I've had my own struggle with boundaries, but I'm learning now. And I'm sitting in the uncomfortableness of the boundary, because mm -hmm. I couldn't bear it. And I, I'm a projector in human design. And I have that means in my, my emotional solar plexus is open. It means I feel everybody's emotions, which is what makes me empathic. But it's also what makes me not want to have confrontation because I can feel their disappointment, their anger and everything. I feel it in myself. Mm. I feel it within my body as if it's happening to me. It's the most terrible feeling. So you run from making people unhappy, which makes you a people pleaser. And I've had to learn to sit in the discomfort of that emotion in exchange for my energy and my sanity, frankly. I needed to sit and be like, okay, this is going to feel yuck. He's not going to like it, but I'm, I'm going to say I have to go because if not, I'm going to be totally drained by the time mm -hmm. I get back inside the house. And mad. <laughs> right. And so I think it's about choosing yourself again, which is what he's talking about, right? This idea that we have to make everything okay for everyone else is learned. So we've got to question that. When is it really appropriate for me? to open myself up and give you my energy and when is it not? And when do I just not have it to give? And then be okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so weird when I say that so many people are like that around me. I mean it. It's wow. like really strange. Maybe it is something inside of me signaling to them that they can let down and speak so, yeah. and it's safe and that's beautiful. But it is draining, honey. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we need to have a, a safe word Maybe. For yourself? Yeah, we need yeah. to create a safe strategy like, oh, <laughs> my belly hurts. <laughs> I got to go. I got to herpel away I gotta, now. I got bread in the oven. <laughs> I got to go. <laughs> I don't know what oh, too doing. many words. Oh, I love this thought. I mean, as we're coming to the end of our conversation, I love this thought. How much you love yourself 
and how you feel about yourself are directly proportionate to the quality and integrity of your word. So when you start cleaning up your words and you start speaking life instead of destruction, that'll show up in how you feel about yourself and how much you love yourself. And your concept of self is directly related to how you are creating your experience. You create based on how you feel yourself to be. Mm -hmm. And so if I feel myself to be worthy and beautiful and good and kind and talented, I'm going to create on the level of that. But if I don't feel that about myself, then I'm going to create the opposite of that. But it is, so the barometer of this, interestingly, is the integrity of my words and how I am speaking to myself and to other people. And that word integrity, we we associate it with honesty, right? But yes. integrity, to me also, a huge implication of the word is stable. The integrity of a bridge, mm, mm -hmm. right? Is the bridge stable? So to be, to have integrity with your word is to be stable in your thoughts, stable in how you speak, stable in how you receive other people's words. So there is this element of needing balance. The one you spoke of, that gap before speaking, that reconsidering, is this really the highest choice that I can make at this moment? So I think it's as important to have that as it is to be truthful. And truthful to who is the other question? Because are you being truthful according to other people's standards or truthful in authenticity with yourself? That's the other part of the question that we have to learn to discern. Hmm. So oh, good. we're learning. We're learning. <laughs> we are learning. We're learning. Life is about learning. It is. This book is so good. It is a game changer. And once again, you don't have to be super spiritual to get anything, like to get what he's offering from this. You don't have to be super educated or a big reader. Like this is actually written in such a simple way, not like a dumb way, <laughs> but like no. simple, straightforward, uh, very confidently, as we were saying, mm -hmm. um, very authoritatively, super easy to understand and super easy to see yourself in. Like just the examples that he gives of moments where someone might have spoken a curse over us or the times that we have engaged in gossip and what that actually does to us and to other people. Like it is so entirely relatable and you have time, everyone, to catch up. You can go yes. and get this book. We're going to be doing chapter three and chapter four next mm -hmm. week, which mm -hmm. deal with the second and the third agreements. The second agreement is don't take anything personally. This one changed my life. Yep. This one changed my life. And then the next agreement is don't make assumptions. So we will be covering those two chapters next week and you still have time to go out and get the book, get it on Kindle, bind a copy, honey, and read it. Follow along because this stuff is so good. Too good to miss. Too good to miss. And I know, um, Miss Elanique, that you have, you are creating a meditation for us to enjoy yes. this week. Do you want to tell everybody a little bit about that? Well, basically, I wanted to address what he speaks about in the book about this conditioning process and the lack of choice that we have in being conditioned. And I want to, to allow us to go through an experience of recognizing that that conditioning is there, but also of the process of taking back our agreement with that conditioning. And we do that by stepping into the light that we are and remembering and experiencing that light. Because when you are vibrating as that light, you can recognize when other things feel icky. You can recognize when your words don't match who you are. So the more you sit in that high energy of the truth of who you are, the easier that conditioning can be undone. So that's the goal. Mm. It sounds like we all need some of that. So yeah. if you are listening to this <laughs> on the podcast, the meditation will be offered as an additional podcast episode. Mm -hmm. If you are watching on YouTube, then this meditation will be offered as an additional video released at the same time that this is. So go ahead and make sure that you look for that and that you do the meditation because they're very, very, very good. Yay. Well, is there anything else that we 
want to say before we leave definitely if you guys have any questions or commentary please know that you can write us at miraculous thinking at gmail.com mm-hmm. and you can also join our facebook group we're growing aren't we we are it's so we sweet. are exponentially and we have our new web page or our website www.miraculousthinking.com <laughs> Crystal. I know. Yes. Miraculousthinking.com. And if you click on that, you can find the feed for our podcast as well. So if you, you know, just want to have a shortcut, you can go to the website and the podcasts are linked there. Is the ebook on that too? The ebook is, I believe so. Let me okay. check. I'm I mean, sorry. I've been, no, so, the, the I've been so is busy. On Facebook. It's on it's Miraculous Facebook. Thinking okay. under files. The okay, so if you there. want the ebook, which helps you to connect with your mechanics of manifestation, totally, then you have to join our Facebook group at this time. But it's a small little group, and it's mm-hmm. it's it's fun. It's 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 really sweet. Um, and if you want to check out our actual episodes, and we'll probably be putting the assets, the files, the ebooks, mm-hmm. the meditations on this website, go to yes. miraculousthinking.com, and it's all there. It's a beautiful easy thing. So easy. Well, it's been lovely meeting with you today and having this chat, and we'll be back next week for more of the same. Yes. Bye, guys. Bye.